What is good, everybody? Welcome to the Gold Standard Podcast. I'm Rob Stats Guerrero alongside the human wet blanket, Levin Black. Levin, nice to see you back in your old familiar sidekick chair. <laughs> it's the same chair, actually. It's a nice uh, metal black with a tiny bit of padding chair. It is not the most comfortable chair. See the sacrifices I make? Well, I want to say this sincerely. You did a fantastic job filling in solo on the instant reaction show on Sunday night. So thank you. Thank you. A grateful 49ers nation is uh, appreciative of your efforts. Yeah. You almost slipped up there and said Niners nation. I, I noticed that, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate it. You know, you, you're the same way as me. And uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I know I did good enough, but I didn't do as well as I want. You sound like Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, it, no, it's, you know, we texted some. I am all, I have always been, I learn really quickly. And the first time I do something, it's like my brain doesn't know how to process things. So it's going through like what to do. And the second time I do it, it's like a whole different level. That's the first time I've done live shows. I've not done live, like instant reaction shows with fan feedback right there. Like I did live shows all the time on the radio. And but not like live shows where I have a bunch of comments to get through and live shows where you can't plan that. That was the big part. Like I couldn't plan and be like, all right, we're going to do this topic and then we're going to do this topic and then we're going to do this topic. because that's how my radio show was. But not so easy, huh? You have a newfound respect for me, huh? I do a pretty good job, right? Those are all you could say it. I mean, you just uh, showed I, I did one time and I did. How did you put it? fantastic job so just keep that in mind you're replaceable no you did fantastic i didn't say you did as good as i usually do. <laughs> uh, please like and subscribe to the gold standard network youtube channel and as always rate review and follow the gold standard podcast i always say if you leave a review i will do my best to read it on the show this one comes from clifton b parker five stars love your show but one bone to pick clifton says absolutely love your show and all the very informative guests my favorite is levin black I learn a lot, and I think you deliver the best content in Niners world. Very well produced. But, bone to pick. Based on this Thursday's show, meaning last week, now you guys are all in on Brock Purdy. That should have been clearly apparent last season after his performances. He hit the ground running, unlike Trey Lance ever did. The eye test is and was clear, yet you went the entire offseason lamenting Trey Lance's lack of opportunities. So, was that just a convenient narrative for the offseason to get attention, and now we know what you really think? Just my two cents. Clifton, don't lump me in with Levin over there. Levin is sold on Brock Purdy. I still am not, okay? And that's not a criticism of Brock Purdy. That would be me with any young quarterback on the 49ers. So don't, you know, don't get it twisted here. Let's get everybody's opinion straight. If you want to hold people accountable, that's fine, but hold them accountable for their own opinions. When did you become sold on Kaepernick? Never that, that right. So that that's kind of what I figured. We've never specifically talked about it, but that was the example I could think of of somebody that came in, took over the 49ers starting gig. They won a bunch of games and he looked good right away. All right. So you were never completely sold on Kaepernick. No, again, it right. takes like, two I know months. I'm trying to give people an example so they can understand right. You, it doesn't matter unless they are the one of one Patrick Mahomes winning MVP in his first year or starting, you're not going to call it. Right. Exactly. If they reach a, a ridiculous, like 50 touchdown level of performance, I think that's a little different. And it kind of fits in perfectly with something that's going on now because since the Cowboys game, I mean, really this whole season, but especially since the Cowboys game, I've been tweeting out positive things about Brock Purdy, things that I've seen things that other people have said on film about Brock Purdy, all positive stuff. And yeah, I'm excited about him. I'm excited about the team because they're five and oh, and yet there seems to be some group of 49er fans that think I'm not allowed to cheer for Brock Purdy because I wanted Trey Lance to start that somehow those two things do not mesh in their head. I don't really quite understand it, but apparently there's a group of people out there that thinks this Levin. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> I'm trying not to be too mean here. It's to be expected. You get a large enough group of people and the 49ers fan base is very large. You're bound to have some people that just, they don't want to use their brain logically. 
And I'm not saying Clifton is one of those. I mean, clearly he's pretty logical if he thinks I'm his favorite. So he, he can awesome. be that bad. I don't want to lump him into that group. But there's certain people that are being, you know, not quite truthful. They're just wanting to rant on Twitter. And I've seen them going after you like, oh, now you're in on Purdy on, on Twitter and stuff like that. It's like, if you actually listened, you would know where Rob stood or stands still, basically. For, right. For my part, I yes, I said multiple times that I think both quarterbacks, both Trey Lance and Brock Purdy, had a really high chance of being good quarterbacks, being the franchise quarterback eventually. I preferred to see Lance. I wasn't out on Purdy. I just worried about Purdy's limitations more. And the injury really kind of was the swinging point, right? Yes. Like he looked so good. And I said, I want to say it was after he won his first playoff game. It might've been right before the NFC championship game that with what he's done in the playoffs, he has to be the starter going into the next year. But then the injury happened and it was like, okay, bring him back slow. I want to see Trey Lance. So right. that's been my stance. Like, I was never out on Purdy, but yeah, I was not the highest guy on Purdy. Imagine this. I was kind of in the middle. <laughs> and by the way, we've also seen double the sample size at this point in the season, right? He had five I, stars. I think, he's, season, I think he's better. I think, oh, he's, I think he's despite still. the injury, he is better. And I think his, he's shown his arm more. Now, part of that might be Kyle Shanahan's opened the playbook more and trusts him with some deep passes that he didn't with uh, Jimmy Garoppolo because we know he changed the offense back to a Jimmy Garoppolo offense after Trey Lance's injury. Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't like to throw deep. He'll openly pass up open deep passes because he's too scared. So I think Purdy inherited that playbook. And now this year we're seeing more of those deep passes, more of IUK featured. And I think it's allowing Purdy to show more of what he can do deep. And yeah, he he's good enough deep, right? I think he's really good 40 yards and under. It's just, he, he doesn't have the cannon to do the 50, 60 yard bomb, but I mean, you, you might see a 50 to 60 yard air pass five times in a season from all quarterbacks combined. There's, right. There has not been one this season. I think I want to say it was Burrow had one that was uh, like 47 yards or 48 yards this past game. And that's the longest of the season. So it's, and you don't need to, and this offense certainly doesn't need to, to generate big plays, but you're right. Purdy is better. Okay. His he's up a hundred yards per game over last year, a hundred yards per game. He's lowered his, or he's raised his completion percentage by five percentage points. He had 66 passing first downs in all his regular season starts last year. He has 66 passing first downs already this year. I mean, he's getting better. I think that's obvious. Um, and I, but I just think it's comical that just because I was rooting for Trey Lance that somehow now I can't root for Brock Purdy. That's just really weird and dumb. And by the way, how many times did I say I will be fully behind whoever the starter is when the regular season comes? So it's just it's a very weird thing. Uh, Brock Purdy is third in MVP odds right now on uh, on DraftKings. Plus he just overtook on uh, I think it's Bet US. He's number one. Yeah, depending on the book you want to go to. Maybe if you think he's going to win, then go to DraftKings and get him at plus 700. Uh, that would be if you bet $100, you win $700 uh, for anyone that doesn't know. But he's playing awesome. And I said this to Grant yesterday, Levin. I think it's possible the Niners have the MVP, the Offensive Player of the Year, and the Defensive Player of the Year all on the same roster in the same season. Uh, I think Defensive Player of the Year is very unlikely. TJ TJ Watt at this point is running away with it. And that's because I, I understand you're saying Fred Warner, defensive player of the year. Yes. Linebackers don't win that. Well, you're not wrong. That play, the Warner sack of Dak Prescott yeah, is crazy. one of the most impressive plays I've ever yeah, seen. Broken long. down on Twitter, like all the different things he did, like the stepping forward to break the uh, um, the, mesh. the crossing pattern. Yeah, to, to try to wash the defenders behind him. Now, Warner made the receivers wash instead. Yeah, that, that was an amazing play. That that's a like A plus. You can't find a better play that anybody's ever pulled off. That is so freakishly good. First, he disrupts the crossing pattern in the middle of the field. He steps forward and in front of it, so Dak can't go there. Then 
He fills the passing lane to Dak, the receiver that Dak is trying to go to on his second read. He fills the passing lane so Dak can't go there. And then he jumps and makes the sack. It's unbelievable. That type of play is so ridiculous that he could take away all those things and still get a sack on the play. There was another play in the game where he's basically running not quite stride for stride, but pretty damn close to Brandon Cooks, like 40 yards down the field. And Cooks, I think, caught a pass out of bounds. Like Fred Warner is maybe playing the best football he has ever played. Oh, I would agree with that. He's playing the best he's ever played. He's being more of a difference maker. And part of that is I think he's being uh, put in put in position to do more. He's getting to blitz more. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like he, he's getting the ability to make a difference in the pass game in multiple ways, whereas previously it's been he's going to just take a guy out of the pass play and you're not going to see him much in the passing game because nobody's going to target that way. <laughs> right now but he's getting the feature it, it it's like a champ bailey thing champ bailey didn't have a bunch of interceptions because he was so damn good nobody targeted his position but before we get too much into stuff i want to i want to stay personal with you are you converted on live games i have to say it was way <laughs> different than i thought it was going to be way better than i thought it was going to be i thought there was going to be more sitting around waiting like waiting for the commercial breaks and stuff to end. It's not nearly as bad as I thought. No. You know what actually messed with my head a lot as I, I finally rewatched the broadcast version of the game today is that the broadcast angle is different than the angle that I was looking at sitting at the game. So like there are plays that happen where to me, like the Niners were going right to left, but on the broadcast, mm-hmm. they're going left to right. And it's totally messing with my head. It's like, wait, that, play yeah. shouldn't have happened there you were on the opposite side like the logo at center field was flipped for you yeah so because i was on the cowboys side it was just really like that just screwed with my head but i have to say like if i had to do that in 30 degree weather in rain and snow and cold like no no way i'm not doing it i'm just telling you right now but but in santa clara when it was 80 degrees when the game started and sunny and fantastic yeah sign me up for that couple things i i still laugh at the fact that you texted me like you can see the play developing that, that that's something that's going to stay with me forever that you have a bird's eye view when you're watching from the stands unless you're like one in the first rows which by the way it's one of the reasons why you never want to sit like i never want to be front row ever, right because you can't see crap especially in the end zones like i did that one time uh to a purdue game i bought tickets and i was like hey I want to be down close to the game. So if they score, maybe they come right up to me. Right. And I ended up getting second row in the end zone. And I realized you can't see Jack crap because you're like directly behind. And if they're in, in your end zone, yeah. Okay. You can kind of see the whole develop. If they're on the far side. You don't, you're not far enough up to see anything. Like you couldn't tell anything about what was going on whatsoever. Worst seats in the game or down low in the end zone. I'd rather be in the nosebleeds end zone, but it is different. You get a bird's eye view when you're at the stadium, as long as you're more than like, 10 rows up you're getting a better view than you do on the broadcast so it's it's just a different experience because you see and you understand what's actually happening i think better than the broadcast we'll get to some of the brown stuff that's happening this week and a couple other thoughts from the dallas game but just some other observations i had while i was there correct and people out there can correct me if i'm wrong but i think the idea with levi's was if you want to move around the stadium go to like the outer concourse and if you want like food or to go to the bathroom you can use like the inner concourse i think maybe that's that might have been like what they were thinking but that's not how people use it everybody stays on the inner concourse you can't move like i tried to meet steph at halftime and i know it's halftime it's a busy time but the inner concourse you could not move you were shoulder to shoulder if if people had small kids with them i don't know how they they did it maybe you just didn't get out of your seat or whatever but like you couldn't move at all. But if you went to the outer concourse, there was nobody there. You could walk around. So like I, I had to walk around halfway around the stadium to meet Steph. So I just like fought through to the outer concourse and walked around and met her there because that inner concourse, like you can't go anywhere. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's a norm for major sporting events. The The closer you are to where the seats are, the more crowded it is because people are lazy and they don't move out. I don't use logic. It's not traffic where the traffic lanes force you certain directions. They're going to be illogical. My wife hates it because, like, I've made no bones about it. I have attended probably live 
70 or 80 Purdue games uh, because I had season tickets for quite a long time. I'm very used to knowing how to weave and like there, there's a balance you have to weave between being aggressive when going through the crowd <laughs> and being too aggressive and bumping into people. And like, you just have to make, like, make sure they know I'm coming there and you need to move. And you know what I mean? I know that balance. So I weave my way through a crowd really quickly. My wife does not know the balance. A few times we've been in crowds like that, both at, you know, sporting events and just like major tourist places. She like loses me, falls way behind. I have to eventually just stop and wait for her to make her way through the crowd. And it's like, oh, there she is. (laughs) There's an art to that. I've been to, you know, Yankee Stadium a ton of times, Fenway Park, all that stuff. I get that it's crowded and stuff like that. But they half as many fans. No, I know, but they don't have two concourses. So it's like, of course, it's crowded because there's nowhere else for these people to go. But Levi's does. So that was just a weird thing that I noticed. Um, And then the other thing was because I've heard it's horrible to get in and out of. I had no problems getting in and out. And now, to be fair, once Sam Darnold was there, I was gone. I I left. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then, you, yeah, that's why. But I wasn't alone. And by the way, there was a mass exodus of fans that were leaving. Yeah, but it was Cowboy fans. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It absolutely wasn't just Cowboy fans. There were plenty. And I, why would you stay? There's a, you don't need to see Sam Darnold in there. Um, but I didn't have any problems getting out of there. I had problems finding my car because I am an idiot. But that's my problem. That's not a Levi's. I was say, they make this wonderful thing called GPS and it's in your phone. So when you park at major sporting events, the thing you do is you zoom way into the map and you create a pin. They actually have apps that will do it for you. Yes. So where it's like a highly accurate GPS. Oh, this. Okay. Yeah. And that's what we did, but it took us a second to figure it out. Well, Regardless. I just wanted to make sure you know this because, you know, it's you have an Apple, you have an iPhone. So sometimes they, they're not, you know, the quickest. A lot of times they celebrate getting something new and advertise like they're currently doing with 15. Oh, look at this awesome new feature. Oh, Android had it five years ago. So I just, I'm not sure if you knew that. Yeah, great. Way to be a champion of the Android phone. Look, Hydrox was the first black and white cookie, but it's not near as good as Oreo. So I'm just saying. Anyway, but all in all, I liked Levi's. I thought it was really cool. I didn't get a chance to go to the museum, unfortunately. I wanted to, but didn't get a chance to do that. But I did get to meet Steph in person. Her hair was immaculate, as always. That was super exciting for me because... I haven't, she's the only one of the team I've actually met in person, which is weird considering we've been doing this for how many years, but uh, that was super fun for me. But all in all, it was fantastic. I'm trying to convince my wife to let me go to another game and write it off as a business expense. I don't know. This season or what? Yes, this season. Oh, wow. Like, I got to go back. I got to go. It was awesome. It was so cool. Oh, (laughs) Uh, I've already. My wife, we've already discussed, like, next season, I might just buy, like, you know, fly in Saturday, go to the game, catch a flight out same day, on Sunday. Yeah, take the red eye like I did. Yeah. So, there, there's possible. already, like, yeah, there's already a game plan, so to speak. About negotiations that. have begun? No, it's not really even negotiations. It's basically, she was like, yeah, you would be able to do that, and it wouldn't be that expensive. Because, like, I I think I've told you, I went 10 years ago, actually, currently, right now. Yes, you mentioned I went on my one San Francisco trip. I was there for, I think, nine days, and we spent 10 grand in nine days. (laughs) Because it was, like, all sorts of, like, I'm not cutting any expenses whatsoever. It's before kids, uh, right before marriage. It was, you know, we went up to Napa. We stayed in, like, a crazy resort right on the ocean in that Napa. We went to all the, like, crazy wine restaurants that are expensive when we were in san francisco we went on a shopping spree you know we didn't cut any expense so she has it in her head that you know san francisco is crazy expensive it's like no that's just because we bought really expensive tickets you went made me go to a concert and bought really expensive tickets and we spent a ton of money on all sorts of other things that don't have to happen every time okay that's the personal stuff let's get back into the 49ers you stuff. made your flight right yes the, we did the one you were supposed to make yes not like a next one we did. It was it was a little tight, but we, we got it done. All that matters is you're on the plane when the door closes. <laughs> Let's look ahead to Cleveland. Um, I think most 49er fans, especially coming off that Dallas game, think they're going to kill the Browns. 
Uh, I was actually surprised. Kyle Shanahan yesterday said he thinks the Browns, this is going to be the biggest test that they've faced this season. And that's clearly because the Cleveland defense is incredible. They're giving up 125 passing yards per game. That's it. 125 passing yards per game. It's absurd. I think they're the only team in the league that has not given up 1,000 yards on the season, Something, some crazy thing like that. This Cleveland defense looks on paper to be for real. It, look, it, it is a really good defense. I'm not going to sit here and say that they're like a mediocre defense or bad defense or anything like that. But they are a bit inflated right now how good they look, especially passing game-wise. And I got some things to back that up. You know, they yes, they have allowed very few passing yards. Part of that is they got Burrow week one. When Burrow, you know, Burrow's been getting better and better. He had 300 weeks, 300 yards this week, but he was way off in week one. Um, but in two of their games, two out of four, because they've had their bye week, they weren't very good. They gave up 222 yards to Kenny Pickett the week after we played them in week one. They played him in week two, and Kenny Pickett had 222 yards, which is above his average for the season, and the Steelers won. The Steelers put up 26 points. What did the Niners give up to them? Yeah. So, to me, that, that's a big hit. And then their most recent game again against the Ravens, yes, they gave up less than 200 yards passing. You know why? Because they got their asses handed to them, and Baltimore stopped passing the ball. Lamar Jackson was 15 of 19 in that game with two touchdowns plus two more rushing. And, by the way, when you take out Lamar Jackson's Rushing stats and just look at how the running backs did in that game, which Baltimore running backs might be the worst in the league due to some injuries <laughs> and stuff. They averaged 4.4 yards a carry running the ball too with their running backs on 24 carries. So I, I think that defense isn't quite as good as they've looked. And there's you can go deeper and I'll, I'll get deeper as we go in. But my point is, is like the defense has been inflated because they played a pretty soft early schedule. And they played Burrow when he wasn't Burrow, when he shouldn't have been playing. Burrow should have sat out that game. I could, I could hear what you're saying. I'm picking up what you're putting down, so to speak. I do think they are still very good. And I saw a tweet from Jack Hammer, which I thought was really interesting. It was about Jim Schwartz, who, of course, is the Browns' defensive coordinator. I believe Kyle Shanahan has never beaten Oh, no, he's not. It's He's one and eight. Excuse me. It looks like Jack has updated the tweet. And I'll try and throw it on the screen here for people that are happen to be watching the, uh, the stream on YouTube. Kyle Shanahan has faced Jim Schwartz nine times. He's one and eight in those matchups, and his offense has scored over 20 points just one time. As the Falcons OC in 2016, Shanahan's offense averaged almost 34 points through the first nine games. In game 10, they faced the Eagles with Schwartz as D.C., Philadelphia held Atlanta to 15 points. It was the only time that season that the Falcons did not score at least 23. So that's not nothing, but I will also say, like, I was kind of saying the same thing about Dan Quinn, and Kyle Shanahan just put Dan Quinn in a straitjacket on Sunday Night Football. So I don't know necessarily that this trend is going to hold, but I think it's something worth talking about. It, it is alarming. I was not aware of this before you brought it up. I did not know Jim Schwartz was that much of a Shanahan killer, so to speak. Um, and we all know Jim Schwartz. If you're thinking, boy, that name sounds familiar, but I can't place it. That, that's who uh, Jim Harbaugh very politely patted on the back <laughs> when he was head coach of the Lions uh, <laughs> and nearly started a brawl after the game. But that that is a little bit concerning. How much of it really matters, I don't know, because I will say, like, I don't know that this 49ers offense this year is anything that Shanahan's run before. Yes, it has a lot of similarities, but we've already talked about how the run game has changed since Shanahan took over. He talked about how so many people have run the outside running scheme that he's had to go more interior. He talked about that in the offseason on that podcast. And then the passing game, uh, this is the passing game fully unleashed, which we haven't seen in his San Francisco tenure at the very least. Yes. And that Atlanta team was very much a – get it to Julio and that's it. So this is more of a complete offense where it's not just one guy. I totally agree. This is an offense that, that the 49ers have not had under Kyle Shanahan ever, ever. Like it's, they, they can do whatever they want to do, whatever they need to do. 
against you. If they need to run the ball and grind it out, they can run the ball and grind it out with Christian McCaffrey and Jordan Mason. If they need to put up a bunch of points, we've seen them score 30 points every game this season. They can do that too. If they can't run and you've got to put the ball in the hands of Brock Purdy and he needs to throw 30 times, he's certainly comfortable doing it. And for the first time ever, I think Kyle Shanahan is comfortable Mm -hmm. in that kind of game. So this, yeah, this offense is definitely something that the league has not seen with Kyle. It's the offense I think Kyle always wished he had. Certainly the offense we all wished we could have when Jimmy Garoppolo was here. It's what we've been wishing we could have 20 years now. (laughs) Well, that's true. Yeah, and it's here, and I'm loving every minute of it. So how do you stop this offense? What's the one thing that hasn't come up yet but would would be killer to this offense? Well, an injury injury to Christian McCaffrey. I'm talking about in a a single game. I don't know. The one thing every offense gets stopped with. Pressure up the middle? Turnovers. Oh, okay. Right? You got you to gotta turn this ball. To, the Niners are scoring on offensive drives on the, at the highest percentage of any team. They're higher than Miami, you know, in terms of amount of drives that have resulted in points, whether a field goal or a touchdown. They lead the league. So you don't stop this offense. The only way you stop them is turn the ball over. So far, the Niners haven't done that. And on the flip side of it, this is my second favorite stat to kind of knock the Cleveland defense down a little bit. They've only forced three turnovers this season. And in terms of interception percentage, they're intercepting less than 1% of passes, which is fifth worst in the league. They're not a turnover defense. They've just been a, we're going to stop you from scoring defense. And the Niners have been the best at the in the league offensively at scoring. So I kind of feel like that trumps the Cleveland's ability to stop. They might stop the Niners offense more than it has been stopped because it pretty much hasn't been stopped this season. But they're not going to stop it all the time, and I don't think Cleveland can score against this Niners defense. So that's why I'm still pretty confident in this game. Well, yeah, that I, I wouldn't be shocked honestly if there was a shutout this weekend because it looks like Deshaun Watson's not going to play, and it's going to be PJ Walker. And no disrespect to PJ Walker, PJ Walker, not uh, they're not going to go to Dorian Thompson Robinson. Had no. Three interceptions in his one start. Yeah. Nope. So. It's going to be P.J. Walker, who's coming off the Browns practice squad more than likely. Or it's going to be a banged up Deshaun Watson, which to me, like, you know, that's in the 49ers favor either way. Um, The defense of the Browns goes man to man. Like they just lock you down on the outside and they let Chubb and they let those guys just come at you. And I got to say, like, Kyle can beat man to man. Like the Niners have the studs to beat your best defenders in man-to-man coverage, whether it's Ayuk, whether it's McCaffrey, whether it's Kittle. If you go man-to-man too much against the 49ers, Kyle's going to eat you alive. So this brings up a couple more. I got a lot of stats in this game. Like I said, there's a lot of like, when you look further than just the results Cleveland has had, and you look at kind of like against this, what do they do? The Niners, it's like, oh, the Niners' strength, they suck at. That's the one weakness they have is what the Niners do well. And on this... The Cleveland offense, okay, first off, yes, they've been great on the outside. Their top two corners on the outside might be the best pairing in the league. They've only allowed 44% of passes to be completed when a wide receiver has been targeted. But on the flip side, their linebackers are their weak spot, right? Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, what does Kyle kill? Linebackers. That's what he always tries to target. They have given up 74% of attempts have been completed the tight ends and running backs. Both of them are very high percentages. Running backs at 17 out of 24. Tight ends have gotten the completion on 12 out of 15 targets. So they're weaker up the middle, and that's when Kyle Shanahan attacks. Who do the 49ers have to, pes- to catch passes from the running back position? Oh, they got Juice and Christian McCaffrey. What tight end do they have? Oh, they have Kittle. So that's what I'm getting at. It's like a lot of the Cleveland's weaknesses on defense, which they are a good defense, but they do have weakness. They're not a complete defense are what the Niners specifically are able to destroy. And there's one more stat that this is my favorite stat of them all in terms of why I'm, I don't think this defense is going to be able to hold up against the Niners offense. In terms of yak per reception, Cleveland is third worst in the league. They give up uh, 5.79 yards per completion of yak. So when they do allow a completion, they don't do a good job of tackling and getting the guy down. And the Niners are the best in the league at yak. 
Well, because usually if you're in man to man, right, everybody's guarding their guy. And so it takes right. the defense a little more time to to adjust. Um, so that's going to me going to be like the crux of it. It's going to be, can you survive the Browns pass rush, specifically Miles Garrett, who is a, just literally like uh, he's from another planet. If you've ever seen just Miles Garrett, the, the guy without the pads on, you're like, holy crap, what do we do if his planet sends more? If they can hold up against Miles Garrett, there's going to be opportunities in the pass game, whether it's IU, Debo, whoever you want to get. And then the Niners should be able to run after catch. And we've seen the Niners, whether it's Aaron Donald or Micah Parsons, they usually can hold their own against the superstar on the other side of the ball. Now, TJ Watt had a phenomenal game against them, so I'm not going to say that they beat TJ Watt because they certainly didn't. But for the most part, they've been able to sort of scheme and work around that. So that's what they're going to have to do again this week. Part, part of the reason why TJ Watt went off and a Micah Parsons didn't as well, is T.J. Watt moves all around. They will move him to wherever they think is most advantageous, and Miles Garrett moves all around. I mean, we we already talked about it a couple weeks ago. Probably the funniest clip in a decade or more in the NFL was Miles Garrett <laughs> swapping <laughs> sides of what where he was going to line up. He went right. So two tight ends motioned to go block him on the right, and then he went left, and those two tight ends – went and followed him and he just kept swapping sides until they got a delay of game penalty because they were never set. So they could never hike the ball. Miles Garrett will swap sides to get wherever he thinks he is. So it's not, a, it's not a case of like an Aaron Donald where you can just move the pocket all the time because you don't know what side he's going to necessarily be on. Right. Miles Garrett. That is one more nugget. I wanted to share with people from this, from Nick Wagner of ESPN. One issue that the Browns have they struggle against play action. They're giving up nine and a half yards per attempt against play action, which is 25th in the NFL. Purdy is averaging 10.6 yards per attempt with play action, which is top five in the NFL. And we know Kyle Shanahan loves his play action passes. So this could be literally a situation where the Niners are running the ball. And then most of Brock Purdy's passes come on play action and play action in man-to-man against Kyle Shanahan in this offense, I will take my chances happily. But those are sort of the uh, the weak points or how maybe Kyle Shanahan could attack this Browns defense. When I woke up yesterday morning, the spread was Niners by five and a half. And I gleefully smashed that bet, <laughs> taking as many places as I could find it. Because to me, the Niners by less than a touchdown is... That's a win for me. I checked it before we hit record, and it's up to seven in some places. So clearly, I think the the market is adjusting a little bit. Plus, I think people are kind of getting the idea. Deshaun Watson didn't practice on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Probably not going to go. So that's contributing also. But I just, unless the Niners turn it over, which it's going to rain, Levin, and there could be some wind. So weather could be a factor, which sometimes can be a neutralizer and, and lead to turnovers. But if that doesn't happen, I don't see the 49ers losing to Cleveland. Uh, like I said, I don't see the 49ers losing until they do because they've just been beating every team. But I can actually one-up that uh, play-action statistic that you threw up there. You're such a stat topper. <laughs> well, I got – I got, I literally have it sitting here on my phone ready to read. All right. It, it go comes ahead. from D Doug uh, – I think it's Farr. I've never actually heard his name pronounced. Um, but Doug Farr. Uh, he says the Browns have been a phenomenal defense when going against a run without motion. They've only allowed 1.4 yards on rushes without motion prior to snap. However, mm -hmm. with motion, they've allowed four and a half yards per rush. What do the Niners do more than any other team? Pre-snap motion. Like, that's what I was, Right. Th th this is what I was talking about, like, there are so many things that when you dig deeper than just the overall stats the Cleveland defense has actually put up, the things that they're weak on are the exact things the Niners are strong on. And that's why I don't think this Cleveland defense is going to be able to stop the 49ers offense. Yeah, I believe Miami uses motion the most. They're at like 85% or something, or at least they were going into the games last week. Kyle Shanahan and the Niners are second at like 79, something like that. But yeah, clearly, because that's what the Niners like to do. They like to shift guys and they like to send guys in motion because they constantly want to change the picture for your for the opposing defense. And they, they here's the thing. The Niners know the rules. So they know what they're doing to you when they shift all those guys. They know exactly how to break you. And they've done it time after time after time. And uh, you're right. I hope you're right. I want to see another 49ers blowout. Of course. Who wouldn't? <laughs> 
So do you think the 30 point streak continues? That's tricky. Cause like I said, there are a lot of underlying things that the Niners should be able to put up points, but overall, I still think this is a good defense. And I think this is a game that Cleveland is going to come out because Watson's not in. They're going to try to run the ball. That's their only hope without Watson. And they don't have Nick Chubb. Right. But they're going to try to run the ball, which runs the clock. The Niners are going to want to run the ball if they can run the clock. It's going to be a faster game. You know, I've said that before. 30 points is hard when you're able to run the ball a lot. But I am I, I think I'm at the point with the 30 points. I'm not going to predict less until it happens. I agree with you. How I mean, how could you? Like, I just, I don't understand why you would all of a sudden. Let me circle back to something to Brock Purdy, because we were talking about him earlier and how I'm still not, you know, willing to say, I I know for sure he's definitely going to be the franchise quarterback for the next 10 years. Maybe some weather in Cleveland on Sunday, maybe some rain, maybe some wind. One of the things we don't know about Brock Purdy, because we just haven't had the opportunity to see it, is how does he play in bad weather games, right? We don't know. We don't know if he's good in the rain. We don't know if he's good in the snow or the mud. We just, it. we haven't seen it yet. I'm not saying he's not. Before you jump all over me, people, I'm just saying we haven't gotten, that's one of the things that we're going to learn about him as his career goes along. But for me, it is part of the reason why I'm just holding my horses here with Brock Purdy. Because, Levin, one of the places that I think where physical skills can help you is in adverse conditions like weather, right? Super windy game. What do you want your quarterback to have? A big, strong arm. Th- that's just that's facts. You need a stronger arm to get through the elements. If it's a rain game, again, a stronger arm will help. Bigger hands will help in a rain game to help you hang on to the football. Physical traits and abilities help in adverse weather conditions. And I don't care how mad 49er fans get. That doesn't change the fact that Brock Purdy's arm is not the strongest. Okay. It's just not. It's flat out not. And now in in perfect conditions, it's clearly not an issue. It's not an obstacle. It's fine. Change the weather conditions. I'm not saying he'll never be able to play in the rain. I'm saying it might be harder for him than it would be for a quarterback that has a stronger arm. That's all I'm saying is we haven't seen how he'll do in the weather, and we may have some weather on Sunday. So I don't know his home road splits in college, but Iowa State is an outdoor stadium in the north that has bad weather. So I would imagine he has plenty of experience and has learned what he needs to do to be as best as he can. I get what you're saying. Yes, like when you can't grip the ball perfect because it's wet, Arm strength overcomes that to a certain degree. It lowers the max distance you can throw the ball, so to speak, right? And when your arm is already below average, you could end up being too weak there. But like I said, he's played enough to know his limitations in weather because he played a lot at Iowa State and they have an outdoor stadium. So to me, that's not something I'm overly concerned about. And that's an interesting uh, line that you just had there because I just rewatched the broadcast of the game because, you know, I like to hear all the little nuggets and tidbits. And one of the things that Brock Purdy apparently told the NBC crew is like, I know my limitations. I know what I can do. I know what I can't do. I know my arm is not the strongest. I'm not trying to rip it 65, 70 yards down the field. I do what I'm good at. I stick to my strengths. And I think that in a weather situation, just knowing that and being aware of that, if you're Brock Purdy can actually help you. So that's actually a really encouraging comment from Brock that essentially like he gets it, you know, he knows where his strengths lie and he knows he needs to accentuate those to win. And he was saying it in terms of throwing with anticipation, but I think it helps in all circumstances. That's the advantage of playing a bunch in college. Is it not? We've talked about that plenty with this team, the difference between him and Lance. How do you know your limitations if you never have played? And that's Lance's entire problem, right? Purdy doesn't have that problem because he played as much as you possibly can in college. So you don't think of weather will be an issue? You're not you're not worried at all. I, I'm not I'm not overly concerned about it. I'm worried in that weather always introduces the risk of turnovers. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the only way you're stopping this offense is turn it over consistently. Please tell all returners, Ray Ray McLeod, just fair catch it. Just hang on to it. Don't worry about actually returning it. We don't need that from you. All we need from you is to not screw it up. Kick returners, 
unless that ball is kicked short of the 25 yard line, fair catch it. Cause you'll take it at the 25 and you'll be good after that. Don't try to run it. Up. By the way, weird stat. I noticed yesterday. How many kick returns do the 49ers have this year? Well, they had none last this past week because Dallas kicked it out of the end zone every chance. So I uh, let's see four game at least four games. I will say eight. One. Really? <laughs> One kick return, and it came uh in week four. Ray Ray McLeod took it out of the end zone and only gained 15 yards. That was it. That's the only kick return the 49. It's just a weird stat because I think the ball has just been going out of the end zone, but on Sunday, if there it's should ranked. never be kick returns for any team in the NFL, because every single freaking team kicking the ball off should say, I'm going to kick it through the goalposts so that there's no chance to return this because there's no reason to risk any return anymore. Ever since they moved the lineup for kickoffs to try to encourage more touchbacks, it's not worth the risk. Just kick it out of the damn end zone. I completely agree with you. One more little nugget I want to get to because. I think I was wrong or yeah, I'm just, I think I was wrong. I'm sure you were, but what is it? This defense is giving up 13.6 points a game. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's yeah. insanely good. And I'm sitting here like, Oh geez, you know, I don't know about the defense. Like, no, <laughs> they're doing pretty damn good. 13.6 points a game in 2023. That's absurd. And Steve Wilkes deserved credit. And I was wrong. That's uh number one in the league, by the way. Um, yes, it, I did have this thought during the Cowboys game, and I didn't say it in the instant reacts because I wanted to research it more. Will Wilkes be a one and done? It's possible. He, he already got one head coaching gig, but he got screwed in that one. I mean, he was sabotaged. We all know that at this point. I mean, they literally have a lawsuit going on over it. He was sabotaged in that head coaching gig. If he comes in and the Niners have the number one defense and they – or even close to it, and they have a long playoff round, potentially even win the Super Bowl, would he not be near the top of everybody's list when they're looking for a defensive head coach? I would imagine he would. Like, why wouldn't he be? You know, I mean, and that looks... At the very that, least, he should interview. That job is a pipeline, right? Robert Sala, yeah. defensive coordinator, head coach of the Jets. D'Amico Ryan's defensive coordinator, head coach of the Houston Texans. Like, it clearly has been a pipeline for, for people around the league, and Certainly, Steve Wilkes will be right in those conversations. I know we're jumping ahead quite All a right, bit. Right. I, I could see him doing the D'Amico route of, look, I'm flattered. I'm sticking around one more year. Probably depends on if the Niners win the Super Bowl, right? Uh, a lot of it depends on what what uh, team comes calling. Well, maybe that's... If and the maybe Chargers it's... come calling with Herbert sitting there as your franchise quarterback... I don't think anybody's saying, no, thanks. I, I'm not interested. I'm going to stay a defensive coordinator, right? There are potentially a couple of gigs coming open that you got to be a really terrible coach to not be winning with. And that Chargers is right at the top of that list. Like Staley cannot be a good coach if he can't win with Justin Herbert as quarterback. The thing, though, I think is what's going to happen is Staley is going to get fired this year and Kellen Moore is going to move up and become the head coach there. He's currently it's, the OC. It's quite possible, but they're not allowed to just hire him outright. They have to do interviews due to the Rooney rule. Yeah, but that doesn't if stop. If you remember, the Rams ran into that because I think it was uh, – was it – it was um, Hazlitt took over as interim head coach, did so well. They won like six out of seven games to end the season, and they wanted to just hire him outright, so they just made him permanent head coach without doing anything. And the NFL said, nope, you're not allowed to do that. You must do interviews. And then they lost like – the last two weeks of the season and the bubble burst and he ended up not getting the job. <laughs> yeah. But like these teams, I know they have to follow the Rooney rule, but they generally hire who they want to hire, especially if they have somebody in mind. Yeah. But minds can get changed in those interview processes. Yes, can. We, we just heard a lot about the McVay situation on that podcast this off season about how like they sat down, they wanted Marshall Falk to really sit down and talk to these guys. And they thought this guy's way too young to ever be the head coach. And when they came out of that meeting, Marshall Fox said, that's your guy. You'd be an idiot not to hire. Yeah. Minds can certainly get changed hundred um, percent. So we'll have to see how that works out with great Steve topic Wood. for week five or week six, huh? Well, I started it by talking about the defense <laughs> this year. You're the one that ruined it by looking at, you know, 18 weeks or whatever it is. But now this defense is humming and it is awesome to see. 
Nick Bosa is starting around, you know, look better and better and better and actually get some sacks, which is really nice. Um, Kyle Posey had a really good breakdown of the defense on his YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to go and check that out, I was, you know, like I love the offensive breakdowns, but it's cool to see somebody actually go through the defense and highlight the different players and stuff and schemes. And we got to give defenses a little more love. So Niners, 13.6 points a game. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Quote our pal, Larry David. And the record is. What are you talking about? For points per game. Uh, the 49ers record? record or in a single no, season? No, single season. I'm actually second guessing myself now on whether or not I remember it. Well, now you have to tell us whether it's true or not. Well, Say yeah, it. I'll have to look it up. But do you do you know who what team owns the record for fewest points per game? It's the I'm at Steelers in the 70s? No, nope, it's the Ravens. Oh, wow. And I, I want to say it was 10.6 per game. So <laughs> so absurd. <laughs> I'm not, I know it's 10 something. I can't remember for sure. So I got to look it up now because it's going to bother me if I don't look it up. But that's part of why I know these numbers, because if I think of it, I have to look at I, I can't function until I look up uh, points per game and or whatever factoid pops into my head. I go, yeah, yeah, I need to look that up. Well, think about that. I mean, that's basically a field goal worse than the best defense of all time, you know, by that number. So, uh, yeah, the defense deserves credit. Steve Wilkes deserves credit. Niners have eight interceptions this season. That is the, oh. uh, tied for the league lead with the Bills. 10.3. 10.3? Yeah, I said 10.6. Okay, so the Niners are at 13.6. So, it's yeah, it's pretty damn close. I like the fact that when you have to look something up, you don't listen to anything I'm saying. No, I like I said, I can't function until I look it up. I literally can't. Normally, you look that up in the background for me because... You have, I'm assuming you have dual monitors when you're doing this stuff because you can quickly use your keyboard and stuff. I don't, so I have to go like this if I'm trying to look something up and click away from actually being able to see you when we're talking. I don't have dual monitors. I'm just that good. So you just like look away while I'm talking and don't actually, yeah, I can't stand that. Yeah. I want I to see the my, person who's talking to me. See, I use my ears and listen with my ears and then with my eyes, I look up whatever I need to look up. Yeah, well, That's I'm also not at a desk, so I do have a mouse though right now but it's the kind of peak performance you come to expect from the person in this chair uh, you yes. you can barely function as it is but it's a good thing i'm here to carry you and carry the program yes that that's how it works huh are you going to be available for the instant reacts this week that's all on you buddy all right <laughs> good i'll show you how it's done we'll have a side by side comparison <laughs> By the way, selfishly, can I just say, I needed an early game. Thank you, NFL scheduling crew, for giving us the Sunday. For me, it's a 1 p.m. Eastern time game. Yeah, see, I, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't want prime time. I mean, we know because we're both East Coast. Prime time, fuck, sucks if you're on the East Coast. Growing up, I was East Coast. I didn't. I grew up in Indiana. They didn't do daylight savings time until literally the year after I left. Wow. Um, so I didn't deal with daylight savings time. We were uh, Eastern time zone. For half the year and central time zone for half the year. I hate and all this stuff. it. Right. So, you know, when daylight savings time happens, it happens one of the times it changes is in the middle of the season. So, in the middle of the season, I actually don't remember whether I would swap into Eastern for the end of the season or swap out. I would gain an hour. I wouldn't have to be up so late. Right. So, yeah, e Eastern time zone on primetime games, it's brutal. It's, it's midnight at the earliest. And if it's a actual like Niners game where you you're gonna have adrenaline and stuff, good luck. Good yeah. luck getting to sleep. That's the it problem. <laughs> uh, I mean, I how I was on the plane coming home watching Mike McCarthy's press conference on NFL Network at two o'clock in the morning because I could not go to sleep. Um, you know what's <laughs> weird? I got a funny story on that. So my wife went to bed in the middle of the third quarter. She got too tired. So she knew the Niners were winning. She didn't know like you know. The Niners kind of turned it on right after she went to bed. Um, but, you know, I did the instant reacts, did all that. I went upstairs. She kind of stirred only slightly when I came to bed. And uh, the next morning she goes, yeah, I could tell you were like super excited when you came to bed. <laughs> I'm not going to ask how. <laughs> well, no, not in that way. It was 42 to 42 to 10. I just talked for an hour. Like she could tell, like, so I didn't get a, uh, 
revel in it. You know what I mean? Like when the Niners win, and especially when they win big in primetime, I want to sit and soak it in. I want to watch the post game. I want to watch all the reactions and all that. Couldn't do that because I was doing this and I needed to get to bed. So your brain doesn't go to sleep though. It just starts running through all the good plays. You yeah. know what messed with me on Sunday? So I woke up in Nevada on Sunday before driving to San Francisco for the game or Santa Clara for the game. So I woke up at seven o'clock and I checked Twitter and I'm seeing updates from the Jags game in London. I'm like, wait, what? It's seven o'clock. What's going on? <laughs> Did I sleep in? Is my phone broken? Like, what the hell? I Because I, I forgot that there was a London game, first of all. And then for me, the London game, you know, starts at like 10 a.m. Because I'm on the East Coast. But West Coast time, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. I was like, damn, I got to get my lineup fixed and all that stuff. It's just, it was a weird thing being out there. I'm not used to it. Yeah, like I, I've uh, said this before. I had mountain time zone. That's the best. I, when I lived in uh, North Dakota. That is by far the best time zone, I got to say. It's things aren't too early in the morning. That one hour difference from Pacific makes a huge difference. And things aren't late when it's prime time. You get to bed at like games in at like 10 o'clock instead of midnight. But they still only start at like six, you know, Monday Night Football was 620 start. So it's still like, all right, you're right. I sit down the start of the game. I'm eating dinner. Right. So I, I. That was my routine when I lived out there for a decade. You eat dinner during the start of the game. And then you just kind of, when you're, you know, you just ate, you just want to sit and veg. you got the whole rest of the game to sit and watch. Perfect. Yeah, that is the sweet spot for sure. But uh, definitely glad I went. Really, really want to go again. Hopefully we will. And I think, Levin, and I said this to you in the Instant Reacts, and I said it to Grant yesterday, and he agreed. I think we're going to Vegas because uh, I think the Niners are going to the Super Bowl. It sure feels like that. Yeah, I've already uh, thrown that, uh, I guess, foot down, man, you know, mantle down, whatever you want to call it, gauntlet down. That's what I'm thinking of. I've already thrown the gauntlet down. That, and if they're in the Super Bowl, Vegas trips happen. That, that, that was pretty much my words to my wife. And she, she gets it. You know, I'm not sitting here saying, like, I'm saying, screw you. You don't. You have no interest in me going, but I'm going anyways type stuff. But she gets the, like, Super Bowl media day. That's, like, a dream come true for me. I know you, you've you sat in it, although I would I would suspect you've never been in this role. You've never been the one that gets to do the interviews. You've just been the guy behind scheduling crap. Uh, I could have been, but chose not to. But, I mean, if the Niners go, first of all, if the Niners go, we're talking Robin Levin shared hotel room in Las Vegas. Like, that that's going to be a thing that happens. Uh, but yeah, we will have, we will go to media day and and we'll get mics and all that stuff. But uh, I think we're going to have to start getting those plans together, honestly, because I think it's happening. I think they're going barring a disaster and which I think is injury. Like they're not going to forget how to play football. You know, like I just don't see it. So like, yeah, I think uh Niner fans around the world, you, you can get those Vegas tickets. L- let me uh, pose a theoretical to you. You can right. get Philly. In the NFC Championship game, or you can have Philly knocked off before the NFC Championship game, and the Niners face some other team. What do you pick? Oh, I pick Niners facing some other team. Yeah, so do I. I think some people, they get it stuck in there, and, ah, I want revenge. No, F you, I want the easiest road possible. Yep. Nobody remembers how easy your road was when you when you win the Super Bowl. Nobody yes. remembers. All they remember yes. is whether you won. I don't care about, oh, look at this crazy gauntlet that they went through to win nobody talks about that right the trophy does not count any less just because you beat crap teams on the way to the super bowl 2000 giants you remember that they beat the undefeated patriots do you remember who they even played in the afc championship game i personally don't i could not remember actually no that was the next year i was gonna say no that was the the vikings made it with fire but that was a no that was oh nine against the saints the five, I can't. I can't remember. You don't remember. The only reason why you remember what happened is because it was the Super Bowl itself, and it was an undefeated team. You don't go in saying, you know, what what team have you ever talked about winning in the Super Bowl and going, yeah, but look at the team they played in the Super Bowl. That was so easy. There's <laughs> never been that conversation ever. And I mean, the Niners play the Eagles in the regular season, so especially if the oh, Niners were to win that Week 13 game, I'd be like, I don't need to see them in the playoff like no i want the easiest route possible 
absolutely. Like the Bucs don't have to give the Super Bowl trophy back because the Chiefs' entire offensive line was injured for the game. That's not how it works. You play who you play, and that's it. And I just say, like, when the schedule first released, and I'm so glad we didn't, I told my wife, maybe I can get Rob to go to the Philly game because that's pretty close to him. It's not too far from me. I have zero interest in going to a Philly game. Those fans, it's not that they mess with you. They're physically fine. And I already saw, I saw footage in week one. I forget who they were playing. And it was just a guy walking with his family, like literally has a kid and they're throwing, you know, cuss words at him and they're throwing beers at him as they're just walking into the stadium. Philly fans can get fucked. And I'm saying the F word. I don't care. <laughs> like I saw that video. and I was like, I am so glad I'm not going to Philly because that game is going to be so much higher. There's so much animosity between the two. That yep. fan base is so angry because none of the Niner fans will give them their due because we're all like, our quarterback got hurt. Screw you. All our quarterbacks got hurt. Not right. this one. So, like, if we went to that game, like, yeah, there's a good chance we would get physically harmed. Yeah, and no I, interest. I know the 49er fans, look, there's plenty of fights at 49ers games. Usually they're yeah. among 49er fans, which is weird. But nobody was – I didn't see – anybody give guys in Cowboys jerseys crap at the game that I was at on Sunday, which is kind of amazing. And I actually saw a lot of people that were traveling in the same group where like half were Niners fans, half were Cowboys fans, like way more than I thought. Did you see the viral video? No. What viral? A Niner fan proposed to a Cowboys fan and she said, yes. Oh no. In the stands. In the stands. I actually, on the way into the stadium, I was walking behind a couple, uh, the guy was a Niner fan and the woman was a Cowboy fan and they were passing in the road coming in the same direction in a convertible, a Niner fan and a Cowboy fan who were together, a couple, and they both looked at each other as they passed. And one of them looked at the other and said, somehow it works. And the other, the other person said, yeah, because I keep my bleeping mouth shut. No, you want to know how it works? Because we're like siblings. That's what the Niner 49 or the Niner Cowboy rivalry is. It's like siblings because they were the two the best and they played each other every year in the NFC Championship game. And what's happened since? Neither one of us have won a Super Bowl in 30 years, right? We've both been tortured fan bases. Now there's you know different degrees to it. The Cowboys literally haven't made an NFC Championship game while the Niners have at least made two Super Bowls and you know a bunch of NFC Championship games, but I think there's a shared mutual respect of knowing like, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> we were at the top of the mountain together fighting for that spot at the top of the mountain every year. And now we've both been unable to get there since. And it's been 30 years. So I was kind of like, re- you know, impressed and refreshed and happy to see that. Cause I don't like to see like, it's one thing if a guy's talking trash and then you're the Niners like come back and win. And then it's mm-hmm. like, you know what? That guy deserves a little crap like I'm fine with that but if someone is just sitting there watching their team and cheering for their team when they do good things I'm fine with that like I don't get on people for that I I was worried that it was going to be like a hostile situation but for again where I was just my personal experience I did not see that and I thought that was kind of cool so anyway I I got a great side story here since this is the moment in the show my all-time favorite you just talked about how like you get down you come back all that stuff my all-time favorite was when I was at Ball State Myself and my two roommates decided to travel to an away game because we were playing at Michigan. So in the big house, chance to go to the big house, you know, famous stadium. And we show up and Ball State's in Mid-American Conference, the MAC. You know, they're they're the little brother of the Big Ten. They share a region and, you know, they're the small one. We show up and, like, literally everybody in the stadium is saying, where the heck is Ball State? Who are you guys? Like, they had no idea what our college was. We're like... We're like four and a half hours away. We we share state borders, <laughs> you know. Well, Ball State was winning that game going into the fourth quarter. We were getting like in the beginning, like people were kind of like jokingly, like you would like a little brother, like, oh, you guys actually spend money to come here. It's not going to be worth worth your time, all this stuff. And we actually had like popcorn thrown on us jokingly. You know, it wasn't like you know it's just popcorn. And the fourth quarter. It was stone silent. This was the year before the Appalachian State upset in Michigan. Stone quiet, and we're just three guys standing up and sharing 
when Ball State scored. They ended up losing because, of course, that's Ball State sports <laughs> for you. But, <laughs> but I think it was like a three-point game or something like that. It was one of those where Michigan came back and won. But it was just a hilarious moment that we like literally show up. We're the only three fans for the away team anywhere that we can see in a stadium of 120,000 people. And they're all going, who the heck are you guys? And we're like, what the heck are you talking about? And then two hours later, like, they – None of them would make eye contact. Everybody's just quite, just phenomenal thing that I'll probably tell on my deathbed. It'll be story time again with me. Well, people will be happy when you finally die. I'll just say that. Then they won't have to hear that story. Uh, you're going to go first, so you won't be one of the ones happy. <laughs> I definitely got to go first. No <laughs> doubt about it. Hell, I thought the 49ers are going to send me to an early grave in 2020. So who knows? But no, that is cool. Uh, I have to say, I have a newfound respect for actually attending. NFL games and uh, hopefully I get to do it again and shout out to the one person who recognized me appreciate it hopefully uh, next time I go we can interact you know I'd like to get there a little earlier next time and maybe do some things and plus the seats that I had were not I mean let's just I'm not gonna they were club seats so like you had to have special access to get where I was so I didn't get to meet as many people as I would have liked yeah. hopefully I can if you do, do it again this season because you said you're talking about are you gonna buy like tickets at this point, it would have to be like aftermarket on the ticket yeah. exchange and just be like somewhere in the actual. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what I'll have to do. Uh, so I will be, you know, with the regulars. Uh, but anyway, that's going to do it for this edition of the show. Please rate, review and follow the Gold Standard Podcast Network. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you want to become a YouTube channel member, shout out to all our members. It's less than three dollars a month to get custom emojis membership badges, priority comment response. I just made a bunch of new emojis uh, based on plays and things that have happened this season. So, if, you know, you, you have that at your disposal. If that's something that you uh, greatly enjoy, go and check that out. And I'll give you a follow on Twitter if you want. Vish always makes me include that, so I'm including it. If you want it, no problem. If you don't, I won't be offended in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Levin, have a fantastic Thursday, my friend. I hopefully will. And I hopefully will have a fantastic Sunday. I'd much rather have a better Sunday than a Thursday. Amen.